All right, I'm going to talk about random tabletop role-playing games. I'm going to switch off. <laughs> Mace of Galius is still running in the, into the back. Oof. Uh, I have a glass of water. So I'd like to tell, talk to you about the most recent sort of tradish uh, game I played, which I thought was really, really cool. Let me try to fetch it. Uh, it's Tales of Xadia, and Tales of Xadia is the upcoming official um, uh, game for the Dragon Prince. So uh, the Dragon Prince uh, is a show on Netflix. It's animated. It's cel shaded, 3D, uh, CGI. Uh, to be on, to be honest, to be fair. Dragon Prince, I, I remember launching it on, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, in, uh, boop, 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 boop. I'm going to save this here, I remember uh, trying to watch it on Netflix the first time, and I, I didn't like it, I didn't like the, the visuals, uh, uh, but I wanted to watch it regardless, because it's, um, it's by the people who did, uh, at least some people who did Avatar The Last Airbender. And it is definitely a, a sort of uh, uh, similarities between, between the two. Uh, so let me check if I can put it on screen. And uh, the, uh, the Dragon Prince, it's absolutely lovely. Uh, if you like Dungeons and Dragons, if you like medieval fantasy, uh, I am pretty certain you will love it, and you should really go check it out. Uh, let me no, not the browser I want. I'm gonna try to add it there. Uh, display no window capture. Window capture. I'm gonna call it PDF, and yeah, it seems to be working. All right. Okay, okay, I'm gonna do this like this. Uh, okay, let's try that. Okay, things are happening live here. So here it is, Tales of Xadia, the rules primer. It's available for free. Uh, I'm gonna, oops. I'm gonna post a link to it uh, right now. Uh, it's available for free as part of the, the, the promotion of this upcoming brand new game by uh, the people who did Cortex Prime. Uh, what are, what's their name? Here you go check the, the credits. Uh, okay, but let me post the link first. So you, you can have the, the rules uh, for free. Uh, you can, and yeah, they're, they're enough to play the game already. You can also have the um, an adventure and a collection of characters, uh, pre-generated characters. Uh, I guess I, I could fetch the. Uh, that adventure, which is called Lost Oasis, uh, mm. I, I, I'll try to put on just the character so I don't spoil, spoil the adventure. But just the, the, the starting point of the adventure of Lost Oasis is that you are hired uh, by a mage elf to... Where are the pregens? Okay, here they are. Uh, to visit a floating city which is abandoned and oh, it's nice because actually I've never seen the, the picture of the floating city and uh, you need to recover an artifact on in this floating city uh, which is abandoned uh, before the floating city crashes in uh, a mountain and uh, and 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 then and then I'm not gonna tell you what 
what, what's happening, but uh, with page. There you go. So uh, that's that's still in play test, and uh, I I joined a game uh, at the Gauntlet. Uh, I don't remember the name of the game master, uh, which you can find uh, on YouTube. Uh, when I play, we played uh, this in tr a couple of sessions, and yeah, starting with the pregens, uh, I really like them. I find they're quite diverse. Uh, they, first of all, they, it's really cool they managed. I find to do to create characters who feel really much like the show, without being like pale copies, boring copies of... Oops, no, I'm not on the right viewer. There you go. There you go. All right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I find the characters are really diverse and cool and they're really evocative of the show without being uh, just uh, a, a cookie-cutter a, a more boring version of a character in the show, so diverse in terms of uh, ethnicities and body types also. I love the look of Vinaya. Uh, yeah, we got here a little rogue. And here, uh, of course, you want to play a moon health. Uh, and uh, yeah, we got some uh, fire... Not fire nation, but uh, uh, kind of fire type, uh, sun type, uh, elf, magic wielding elf. And uh, I played Diane, uh, who is this god. And I absolutely love the system. I It was for me, uh, if you follow my show, you might have heard that uh, me s saying that I was uh, slightly disappointed by fate, which I thought was oversold to me as something very simple and streamlined. And uh, um, and 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 Tales of Xadia is how I pictured fate, because when I was told oh, fate is this and that, I started picturing something. It was overhyped to me, and when I played Fate, I was slightly disappointed because it was not what I exactly pictured. I imagined a number of things which were not there, and oddly enough, Tale of Xadia is just what I imagined. So everything works pretty much the same. So uh, maybe we can have a look at the rules uh, together afterwards. But from what I remember from playing, and based on those character sheets, uh, here we go. So. Anything you sh can do or have as your character is defined by a dice. And those dice go by from 4 to 12. All right, it's here on the bottom right. Can, can No, my cursor doesn't seem to appear. So here under stress, just to uh, give a reference, you've got all the dice because at some point uh, you're going to be stressed. Uh, at uh, a level of those dice, so uh, so the way it works uh, when you activate something, you roll one of those dice. You you will include in your dice pool one of those dice. So either a d4, d6, or d8, a d10, or a d12. So then you got your classic stuff, but they all work the same way, which is the thing I really love. You don't have uh, I don't know, trouble, straits, uh, a bunch of things which got different names, uh, beanies to spend, and, and, and health, and still skills with numbers, and things which are described by a sentence. Everything works the same. Attributes, you, the same. You either have, you've got this array of dice you define in, on your character. So if I do something with strength, I will include in my pool a d10. If I do something with influence, I will include instead in my pool a d6. So that's the attribute. Um, values. So your values, they all have the same title. Devotion, liberty, glory, mastery, justice, truth. But uh, they have those little lines which 
describe how specifically your character engages with those notions. So for instance, Diane, my actions speak louder than empty promises. So yeah, uh, and that's the way you're gonna invoke them in game. So a bit like PBTA, I guess, you describe actions that your character is doing and those actions um, I hope, uh, uh, trigger, I'm not sure if it's the right word, I, 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 I think of triggering like uh, a button rather than the, the, the emotional uh, effect. I hope it's okay to, to use that word, but I cannot tell, uh, I can find another one. So you, you, you trigger one of the other by describing your action. So you, you got your values, the same if you involve. So, uh, so if you, it's already very interesting because uh, if you influ if you, the scene is that you try to convince someone of something you've seen that is true, uh, you will include in your dice pool a d6 with Diane for influence and a d6 for truth. And you got two d6 to throw, but there, there are other stuff which might be involved. If I was fighting, in a fight, uh, like something happened, uh, someone got attacked and was about to be arrested by, I don't know, the, the local guards. And I, I get in front of the guards and say, no, no, this person is not, didn't steal anything that other person did. In a way you could say that you are, uh, you are fighting, so you're using your strength, you're, you're pushing, shoving away this guard, but you're doing it in the name of truth. So it would, you would include a d10 for your strength in your pool and a d6 for your truth. So now, imagine, we've got all distinctions and these are different things of background. And again, they are sort of free form in the way you, you, you create them. Uh, I imagine, because there's no character creation, you, you just have a uh, pre-gen character. Uh, here, Diane has got, uh, includes the Rhenian Free Folk, whatever that means. To be honest, I invented sort of, uh, as I was playing, what it might mean or not. Soldier of the Garden, never back down. So, depending how I am describing the situation, I could invoke and include in my invoke, that's a good word, I could include in my dice pool either Durinian free folk if for some reason the guard was also Durinian. I could say that I invoke the fact that I'm. Uh, I could say why I, as I'm about as I'm fighting, I say stop this guard. I uh, you you are facing a soldier of the garden, and I stand for truth, as everyone knows. Uh, I would include in my dice pool the the d8 uh from soldier of the garden or because i really won't back down in the face of uh someone hiding the truth i could also use never back down and those distinctions also have little other effects which i, I will have a look afterwards but just to explain the the continue on this logic of oh you got this scene going on with a uh, diane fighting for truth uh against the, the local guard uh Specialities, spare fighting, agriculture. D8, D6. Okay, I got my spear, my, I got my beautiful spear. Let's say first, no, I don't have my spear. There's a, uh, what, what should I call that? Um, a, ah, what do you call that like uh, the thing that death is carrying around? A sight. Okay, for some reason, when the guard showed up to accuse that person of robbing somebody else, we were plowing a field and using a scythe to clean the field. And that what I had in hands was my scythe. And I described that. So I with my scythe and I tried to block the way from the guards to want to grab this man. I tell them, stand down, I'm a soldier of the garden and I, and, and I fight for truth. Uh, and I've got my sight in my hands, and I can tell to the game master. I could try to convince them uh, that uh, because I'm using a agriculture tool, I could use my agriculture D6, uh, and add it to the pool. Or maybe the game master would say, "No, that's a bit 
of a stretch you cannot use it but it's it's agriculture but it doesn't have to be a skill or in agriculture it can be agriculture to engage with people doing the action of agriculture looking at a field and saying well hang on a minute there's something weird going on with that field of corn or, or anything really or what's the season now you invoke it in your description i try to remember when i was plowing the field what we would do in this type of circumstances so yeah you could you could invoke it agriculture if you got your my Duranian spear, I could invoke spear fighting, or I could invoke neither. If the game master does not, uh, it's just that I have less dice in my dice pool, which is fine. Uh, an asset, so objects, your inventory, but not just your general inventory, but things which are special, uh, sort of. I've got this beautiful Duranian spear, uh, which you can see on the illustration, and that's my asset. And if I say I'm using it to stand in front uh, of the guard, I can add the d8 from my Duranian spear into my dice pool before I do the, the dice roll. And what I love with that, the way it works, or at least the way it was played when I played it, is that it's not that I'm stabbing the guard with my Duranian spear. I could be like, look, stop. I stand for truth. I am a soldier of the garden. As you can see, I've got the Durinian spear, which is the the weapon of the only the soldier of the garden can wield. And then the guard. So you just make sense to invoke your dice uh, and add it to the pool. And then once you make your dice roll, and I might forget the details, but the long story short, the the way it works is that you throw all your dice. And you're going to keep two of them to beat a difficulty. So, of course, if you have higher dices, they are more likely to roll well. But in the end of the day, it's not another kill if you roll 10 dice against someone who rolled just two. If they got good rolls and good dices. Because you're going to keep just two of them to make this total. And actually, you're going to keep a third dice. And that's where also things are interesting and where it, it, it's a way to reflect people who are trained, who are a really, really an edge of uh, uh, the others. So you pick two of your dice uh, which you rolled to beat that total and you get a third dice which is going to tell you, I don't remember what it's called. It's going to tell you, so the two dice together, they tell you whether you succeed or not. And the last die tells you how much how much you succeed, how strong you are in your success. And the way it works is that you pick a third dice, but the, what counts with this third dice is not the result of the dice, it what, it's what type of dice it is. So if, it's, if you just roll three dice and your only dice left is the d4, you succeeded, but just succeeded with a strength uh, or, uh, of four while uh, and it doesn't matter if your dice roll the one or two or three uh four if you use your d4 and your d6 to be the total of 10 by having the six and the four and you're really well on your two lowest dice and you got the d10 left you use your d10 to define what's your or intense is your success and and it's it's really good and yeah, i just find it super clean and where it goes even cleaner, and I'm probably getting some little things wrong, so it might be interesting to to dwell into um, into the, the finer details by going back to the rules, because I'd like to run this game after playing it, is the stress. So the stress, you see it here. Uh, it's, uh, it's expressed by uh, also dice. And you, you got the, you're afraid, angry, corrupted, exhausted, injured, and insecure. And it's a bit like, I really like masks, a new generation. So it reminds a bit of that. But where I find the stress very exciting, so that's where I might get things wrong. But so, yeah, I think, let's say I'm uh, injured. I got a scratch uh, on my shoulder or I strained myself something so something happened and it resulted in me being uh, injured a bit and I got an injury of four uh, 
So this four could become a six, an eight, a ten, a twelve, and when it's a twelve, I think you're you're done. You need to get out uh, of the the situation. Uh, I think that's the way it works. But the, the the bit which I remember, which I really like, is ca is that you can invoke your stress to try to succeed at a role. So if uh, if let's say I'm developing, I'm making things completely. I could so I'm in front of the guard. I'm in the field. I would with this uh, sight. I'm working my agri agriculture. I'm saying I'm a soldier of the garden, and I, I explain to the game master, and as I'm explaining that, the guards notices that I've got a bandage over my head because of my D4 uh, injury. Uh, and he heard about uh, the other fight I got into with a, an even larger guard. So he makes a connection that I'm the one. Uh, I'm the one who uh, who got in the fight with the, that one who was much stronger. Well, then to my dice pool, I had this D4. It will be part of my role to succeed. But the cost of that is that afterwards unless you got special abilities of some kind, which is the case of Diane, you, your D4 will become a D6. Your wound become worse. If it was more a regular fight, like you're hitting someone and so on, yeah, I I do this, and then I I I sort of lean, I... As I'm as I'm hitting him, there's a there's a bit of blood uh, dripping from my bandage on my head. So when you invoke, when you include one of your stresses in the description of your action, you can use the dice for your dice pool, but it 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 becomes uh, it becomes higher. It's gonna turn one notch. So that means that your wound. Uh, becomes worse uh, as you were describing that you were straining yourself during the fight and your your wound reopened and got worse and what I love with that is that rather than have I've got 10 health points or this or that or I'm insecure what's got scared about something and the game master have to remind people oh but remember you you're scared or whatever no the players themselves are encouraged to include the situation the stress under which are their character in the description of their actions and they are rewarded for doing it but there's a cost and I just love that uh, I really 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 love that and I love th the way that everything works the same way uh, it could become a bit tedious uh, if if you have power gamers who try to include as many stuff each time but I think as you get used to the system and depending of how bad or important the stakes are, uh, it could be very dynamic and really, really support the the story, the narration in a in a very straightforward way. And and I can imagine it suddenly it's very easy to oh you found you found this new magical object and you you write a sentence describing it and you you assign to it okay it's a, it's a just minor magical object like it could be I don't know who. Uh, a spell which you know it could be teleportation I like got a ring of teleportation it's super badass so you give it a d12 uh, but yeah you, you just need to decide oh, what's the strength into the narration of that object whatever it is it could be again it could be it could be a magic ring which allows you to teleport or it could be a ring which is a symbol of the king who he uh, was handed to you and when you show it to someone uh they recognize it and they, they know it's, it has a strong meaning uh it could be a 12 also uh it's just in the narration the players and the game master will integrate them in a in a way which is fitting and as soon as they do that the dice is added to the pool so yeah uh so I, uh, I was really, and so the result of that is that you, a bit like masks, it, it you can play a, a physical character like Diane, uh, you can play a, 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 
a scholar like Vinaya or a rogue like Winda and it's it's not the same because they're going to be all different because of all their distinctions and values and so on. Uh, yeah, masks. I keep saying masks. I, I meant masks, a new generation by powered by the apocalypse. So so I, I, I find I love masks, but I'm not always comfortable with uh, PBTA games uh, because I, I was brought up to role playing games through a traditional games and I but I'm really really enthusiastic about Tales of Xadia because I find it sort of finds the balance between those two approaches to role playing games which is a more traditional things like Star Wars D6 or uh, even Fate uh, and something like PBTA so it's I find it very evocative and streamlined at the same time and there's no there's no there's no list of advantages and disadvantages there's no list of spells uh you just make them up on the fly assign to them a strength in the shape of whether it's a d4 d6 d8 d10 d12 and and then you you roll with it uh like masks it doesn't you kind of circumvent the challenge of putting in the same room Batman, Superman, and The Flash, and being like, hang on a minute, uh, The Flash got a hundred actions per round, what do I do? It doesn't matter. It, it, what you describe is something going on with an outcome in mind, and and this results into something. Uh, uh if uh let's say you want to scare someone uh in in masks i'm going to, to back to masks uh if you're batman you grab the person you're just a human being but you you grab the 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 goon you're like i'm batman and you do your roles and they're scared or not when you're the flash you say i grab the goon i travel to the opposite end of the the world uh, I show him the Great Wall of China and then I come back to Elton City and just because of the speed and the situation that goon is probably very very scared and then you're Superman I guess you're strong and old but you you're not gonna yeah you, I mean you can fly with him in the air or on the contrary you might be Superman but you're actually quite bad at terrifying people uh, because that's not what Superman do, does. Hello, King of Demons. Thanks for joining uh, with a party of two. I don't even know King of Demons. Are you much into tabletop role-playing games? Because I'm describing one right now. Okay. So, we're going to drink a bit, and let's go into the rules section to see how much I was talking a, a bunch of nonsense. Or maybe let's go back to Xidian and have a look at uh, if I can make sense again of what he's got under his distinctions, this hinder, uh, and so on. So. Okay, so uh, I don't remember what PPs are exactly. They are they are points of some kind. But yeah, you can decide that one of your distinctions won't apply fully. So your Durinian free folk, you can decide that it's it's worth four. Only you tell the game master. Actually, I'm in a region where. Uh, they don't like the Rhenian free folk so much, or they are not as known or common. So how about for this action, I will take the dice in my pool from the Rhenian free folk, but I'm uh, invoking something which is not quite working, which is I think something a bit like f uh, in Fate, you do something like that if I remember correctly, uh, but it results in you gaining a. a 
a point which uh, you can use for something else afterwards. Oh, wait, wait. okay, it was just that. Soldier of the Garden, H hidden, hinder, gain one PP when you switch out this distinction for uh, a four. Same thing. Uh, okay, I'm a soldier of the garden, but uh, turns out in this area, soldier of the garden have a bad reputation. Uh, so people are still scared of them, but uh, yeah, they, they don't respect them that much. So instead of adding a D8 to my pool, I will add a D4, uh, and you gain a PP or graceful war warrior. If you have one of those uh, PP, of those points, uh, I should look up what they are rather than say PP. Uh, you spend one of them and you can add both your agility and your strength to your dice pool uh, in a test. So again, if it's fitting the narrative and the action you're describing, you, you, like you explain how you, you, you're doing kind of capoeira, and not only you're agile, but very strong in the way you, you do your movements in that fight. Uh, you invoke it, you spend your point, and uh, yeah, in this case, agility and strength for Diane it would be like you add to your pool, pool both your d8 and your 10, which is very uh, impressive. Uh, never back down, hinder the same. So hinder is the same for, for all of these. You can hinder any of them. Um, but resolute, uh, you had one uh, point to add one of your stress die to a test. Okay, so the, yeah, so that's, no, that's the one. Earlier, I was explaining that you could invoke a stress so you're describing your wound reopening to add to use the dice from that stress on your side to re to succeed at a test uh, but that would result in this die from uh, so if it was injured uh, d4 it would go from d4 to so d6 if it was already d6 it would go from d6 to d8 so the 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 worse your wound the more likely you will mention it, which makes total sense. Uh, and you were encouraged to do that because uh, it gives you the biggest bonus, but yeah, the more you use it, the more likely you might uh, end up at a point when uh, it's, uh, you, you're taken down, uh, you, uh, you put out of the game, not, not like killed, but out of the action because of, of what happened. But thanks to Resolute, uh, Diane, and just Diane, uh, you can spend a, a point, and it can do just that, but instead of raising or severe his wound is, he'll do just the opposite. The, his wound will get better uh, because that's that's Diane and he's healing uh, faster. And but again, it's about encouraging players to describe and invoke the conditions, the stress, which are afflicting their character. And yeah, you got different one uh, of those uh, depending on the characters and, and so on, which are, are all very, very cool. Uh, I'm going to include a, a link to uh, my... Um, uh, the the YouTube video uh, that uh, of the, the the game I played, which was great fun. Uh, I I really can't remember. I, I really cannot recommend enough to check out the Gauntlet for all the awesome games they have, because that's where I found one of the uh, that I, where I found this game, uh, an opportunity to play it. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, so next, I was suggesting that we have a look at the the rules proper. So those are the pre-generated character from the playtest introduction adventure, which you can download for free uh, on on their website. Feel free to ask me to post again the link, but if you type Tales of Xadia, Lost Oasis, you will get this with the pregens and this first adventure, in which you explore this abandoned floating city. And you also have the rules primer here. Uh, again, this game is still in development, 
uh, but you can get the rules for free uh, and, and try them out. Um, uh, and I wanted to... What did I want to do? Uh, bum, 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 bum. Uh, yeah, I wanted to have a look at the, the rules. Okay, so here it is. We've got our hero from the show. If you don't know Dragon Prince, I highly recommend to go check out uh, this one. Yeah, 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 uh, Dead Mother. And again, the the visual, first of all, it, takes a, it might take a while for, to get used to it, but also they improve over, over the season. And the, the characters are so <laughs> lovable. Um, I'm going on, so I've got trouble trying to remember the names of the characters, but this one is one of the, the characters from, uh, from the show. Uh, and yeah, I really find the game captures that quite well. Uh, so, yeah, so... Rayla, of course. Rayla, the moon health, with an assassin. Awesome character. Okay, well, it's quite nice. Two columns explains what's the role of the players, what's the role of the narrator. I find it's it's really straightforward uh, as far as explanation of what is a role playing game is. So so yeah, so that's quite good. Okay, let me zoom in on that a bit. So dice, we use five dice as I was saying, dice d4 to d12, and uh, yeah, and you use them in test contests and challenges. So you add your dice in a pool and you roll the dice pool. Yep. So more signs don't always mean better so much as they mean more important or significant in the story. Having a 12 in a trait like strength versus a 12 in a trait like justice doesn't mean that physical strength or value in justice measure the same things. It just means that being inhumanly strong can affect the outcome just as much as being obsessed with justice can. So yeah, your your stats, you're not facing challenges which require you to succeed at a specific attribute or skill like you do often in D and D, you shape the story so that what you are good at is how you're gonna solve a problem. So if your sense of if in again my example earlier that you are facing a god who's trying to take away someone who's actually innocent and you know about that, you can either physically try to stop them taking that person away, or if you're good in justice uh, or if in that situation that's what you want to do, it doesn't have to be the thing you're the best at, but just the thing in, in that situation you want to do, then um, uh, uh, then you, you will say to this guy, hang on a minute, uh, someone cannot be arrested like that uh, because um, I know the laws, or uh, you make this moral argument and then you use justice and uh, you shape the narration. Stepping up and stepping down. Sometimes you swap out one or more dice in your dice pool for dice with more or fewer sides. So that's what we were saying about uh, hindering yourself. To step up, up a die by one, swap it for the die that's one step bigger. So a d4 becomes a d6, d8 becomes a d12. Uh, what? Oh, no, no, no. A d8 step by two becomes a d12. Uh, a d12 step by one. Uh, becomes a d10 if that makes sense. So it's not by one. It doesn't mean the four becomes a five. It becomes the dice, which is uh, bet one step bigger uh, because we don't have the five. Uh, the five uh, we we don't have. I don't know. I guess you could make a dice with five shapes, but we we don't have those. Uh, we we don't do that here. Uh, die rating can you? Uh -huh. All right, all right, all right. Itches and botches. Uh, any die that comes up. With a one, called a hitch. Set hitches at side, and they can be included in a total 
they can't be they cannot be included in the total uh, and count as zero so so yeah that's the thing if actually that's so in the mechanic so that's interesting in the mechanic on one hand you could have power gamers who are trying to invoke as many stuff as possible to have a big dice pool but the bigger your dice pool the more likely you are to have hitches uh, which are ones and those uh, create situations first of all you cannot count them in uh, when you're trying to beat uh, when you're picking two dice uh, they set aside uh, yeah and and if it's the narrator it's called an opportunity uh, why in, in the different terms well it's it's you're on the side of the player so a hitch is something which is hindering uh, to hitch in the plan of the players while an opportunity it's a it's a hitch in a way but for the NPCs but that means that is an opportunity for the player uh, if all your dice come up with ones uh, which again it's interesting because the more dice you roll the least likely you are to have a botch so which makes sense uh, because when you are trained and in the right place and doing the actions properly your chances of being a, doing a bot should be very very low so you, you don't have your, your one ch chance out of 20 like in D&D of screwing up even if you're this amazing fighter with plus 12 uh, if you're in the right situation uh, and you roll a 1 uh, you, that's one chance out of 20 uh, I cannot make the calculation but in this game if you invoke a lot of stuff because it's relevant and you roll six dice uh, the chances of coming out of with six ones are, are very very low if you are tenting something which you're not good at or you're not relevant for the, the thing or you didn't care so much to put the attention in your description out of in metagaming or your character is like yeah yeah I'm trying to uh, fix the thing to cook the dinner or oh, like oh, I care I'm gonna use agriculture and uh, and uh, and this attribute and you roll two dice actually you li you're likely to screw up uh, the roll much more likely meaning that Diane would cook something which is impossible to eat which which again feels a lot like uh, dragon prince uh, with a butch there's no ambiguity about it things bad for your character and sometimes the story hits a brick wall for a moment Plot points, PP, plot points. Uh, so yeah, you just spend them with things to create special effects. Uh, so you're gonna have glass beads and so on. That's your your beanies uh, if you you play a Savage World. Uh, what's going on with uh, Hitch? The narrator was it? The narrator has the ability to activate hitches. Going back to them. Uh, work if. Just try something. Does it work if, when I select? Yeah, it works. Okay, cool. Learning things today. It's quite cool, you know, read a book like that. I'm not a fan of reading books, but having some company while I do it like this, it's quite nice. All right. Uh, let's continue reading. So you may yeah, you need co tokens of some kind. Character journal. Uh, so that's your character sheet. Uh, that's it. We had a look at them earlier. As a player, your interaction with the rules of Tales of Xadia starts with your character journal. Yeah, yeah. All based on archetypes. Yeah, so you will find out later more about them. Okay, we've got Rayla here. So that's pretty much what I was explaining earlier. We've got the six attributes. We've got the six values, which are the their title is the same for everyone, but their description changes. I search for my own truth rather than the truth others feed me, which is which is right now. <laughs> and Dragon Priest absolutely from episode one. And and let's compare that to Diane. Uh, trying not to spoil the story of uh, Lost Oasis for you, Diane was his truth. Was my action speaks 
speak louder than empty promises. So in terms of how do you activate those in the story, it's quite different. But it, again, all of them are quite evocative. You don't need a long thing. You know, it gives you clues for roleplay to build on. It's not just a set of, I mean, uh, bless BRP and all, all trad games, but I really like here that it's not just a value like in, in Star Wars D6 that I love. It gives you, you pick an indication which feeds the narration and it's not either, and it's your background. It tells something about your character, but that's something which is going to come back again and again and again in the game. It's not your background in Dungeons and Dragons or most games which are a few lines on your character sheet and they don't have mechanical impact on what you're doing. You forget about them, you forgot this item you rolled for, you forgot that you have your seller background until that is. You know, those six values, you try to bring them up as often as possible. And I, I, you might change them during the course of the game. I really don't see as a game master why I would, I would, uh, I would not accept that. Um, Moon Shadow Elf. So that's, that's what uh, Raida is, as you will find out once you watch the Dragon Prince, which is excellent. Uh, as a Moon Shadow Elf draws, po Raida draws power from the moon and is at her strongest at night, especially on the night of a full moon. Her heritage provides her with greater natural agility and speed than other elves. So again, uh, yeah, Moonshadow Elf, dice 8. Uh, if you were doing anything, if you're waiting, if you are doing something and you want to really succeed and you put care into planning the action of your character, you will, if you can, wait for a for night <laughs> to do that action and second uh, a full moon if it's possible so so it yeah it shapes the narration it's not just uh, yeah oh yeah we're in blades in the dark and uh, yeah of course we wait for the night but although I think it's always dark in blades in the dark in the school but how does that work anyway uh, so yeah uh, but you can hinder it uh, so yeah, so you could say if in the narration uh, you you say, oh, I enter the courtyard and I try to stealthily go inside and for some reason you want a plot point to use later, you could say, I will step down my D8 to a D4 by saying, but the courtyard is really, you said it was really well lit. That's why I hinder myself. But you don't have to. The, game, the player decides that. Maybe the game master might invite it, say, you know, you got an opportunity for a plot point here if you wish so. Uh, it's up to the player. Health Grace, uh, spend a plot point to step up your agility die in a test, contest, or challenge in your elven speed and balance. Yeah, okay. Uh, I mean, I, I've got images of Rayla doing all those uh, acrobatic feats uh, in the show. Um, so yeah, it's quite straightforward. Uh, you spend a plot point and you, you, you're better at something. Moon shadow form, when trying to hide, sneak, or go unseen during the full moon, spend a plot point to double your moon shadow elf distinction die and keep an extra die in your total. Uh, what do they mean by that? Spend a... and keep an extra die in your total. All right. So I guess what it means by double is that you you have two d8 to roll, not only uh, to your pool, so you don't add just one but two, and then but it uh, but then also you will keep three dice instead of uh, two to be the score, which which. <laughs> that's that's really strong, but yeah, it's only full moon. But that means that you will you will keep asking the game master, when is the full moon? Can I wait for the full moon? Oh, it's the full moon. It's important, and uh, it's really it's very very strong. But but it's really representative of what Rayla is. So I love it. Reluctant assassin. 
Reda has been trained since she was young to join Moonshadow Elf for hunting parties, but her heart is just isn't in it. Uh, so, <laughs> so I just love the name of that Reluctant Assassin because <laughs> you got two things in there. You got Reluctant and Assassin. So you're fighting someone, you're like, okay, I'm fighting that person. I'm super good because I'm I'm a reluctant assassin. I was trained in being an assassin. So I'm super good at fights. But you're you're reluctant. Uh so you could say, Okay, something happens and uh I'm gonna try the the after that that person I'm I'm gonna hide that person and you could invoke it by saying I'm a reluctant assassin I'm I'm hiding the person I'm supposed to kill or and then there's loads of opportunities to okay I'm fighting but I'm reluctant so I'm gonna hinder myself so I get plot points and I describe how I'm hesitating when I'm striking and so on. What do you hate King of Demons uh, as a game master? When you need to keep track of the specialities of, of the players, or because again, what I love here is that all of that works the same, pretty much, and the players are the one who activate invokes them. Uh, act first, think later. More often than not, Raida leaves into action regardless of the consequences, which can make her seem both brave and reckless. So we're gonna hear a character who's really really action oriented uh, but it's got a lot of flavor so it's not just I'm doing acrobatics and action uh, if you do something <laughs> somewhat stupid shit with Rayla you're gonna have your you can use your act first think later uh, uh, thing uh, again you hinder you could come up with an explanation why why you, you're not uh, full yeah yeah keeping track of when full moons are but you know, it's not. It doesn't have to be. Uh, I remember Nephilim. You were supposed to have bonuses like that, and no one would keep track of them, and they were quite vague, or what they were actually doing. But it's more. It's more something you build up to. Like, I don't know. Like you need to attack a group, a nobleman traveling with his entourage, with his guards, and they are in this little fort and they're about to leave and your player asks all right when is the next full moon and as the game master you don't have a calendar and so on you don't really care about that but you you want either you want to give it to them because for reasons it makes sense you find so you tell them yeah it's a full moon go ahead go crazy uh or you tell them well it's not the full moon but it's gonna be the full moon next week, but the nobleman is about to leave the fort, so you could try. You could take the, or he might be leaving the fort, so you're taking the risk of the nobleman leaving, or you're gonna take a different number of actions to slow down the nobleman so he stick around long enough for the full moon. And maybe along the way of the stuff you're doing to try to keep the nobleman around, uh, you will botch something, and suddenly someone tells the nobleman, "Hey, aren't you? Don't you have Moon Shadow Elf coming after you in this place? And we know that. And did you know it's a full moon in four days? And suddenly the nobleman is like, "Oh, I need to leave right now." So you. Yeah, what what if it's a month? You you sort of decide it, I guess. Uh, so it's it's kind of a conversation you need to have with the the players. Uh, it's I mean it's a fantastical world, so who knows when full moons happen? Uh, I certainly don't know, and I don't think it will be a game where you have a chart of that. Uh, what really matters is that you don't have that every session. Uh, I would say, but yeah, like it, don't like it, you. I mean, it's it's up to you. Uh, it's something to agree with the player, and and to be. There, there's so much in there for the player to play without 
uh, without the moon shadow, without having the moon shadow form. So like the moon shadow form is not even the only thing in moon shadow elf. You got elf grace, and it's already very strong. So you can really. I could play as a player without using moon shadow form for a lot of session, and and then have the game master say, okay. Full moon's coming. Shit's getting real. Uh, it's a pity if you're, if you're in a circumstance where there's no no relevance in your moon shadow form. But although you again, there could be a lot of things. Uh, but you make it special. You make it special, and you can have a lot of fun without activating it. It's it's just that thing eventually. What you need to track. It's not so much when it's gonna be the the next full moon eventually. I mean, depends on your type of role, game mastering. It's that it's nice as the game master to keep in the back of your head that one of your players got this thing which gets really strong if there's a full moon. So when you write a story, prepare a session or an arc in your campaign, it's worth thinking. Okay. Uh, is there a place in there where I want to be generous or it's appropriate or it would be really cool if it was the full moon uh, and you make it happen. Um, but but then I, I'm not for... Uh, I think sometimes in role-playing game, especially traditional role-playing game, we tend to play day by day what is going on. I really like uh, uh, jumping a week, a month and so on. And you can do so like they do in movies without stating the date, saying one week later, oh no, we are the 16th of, of whatever. I used to play Dungeons and Dragons like that, you would be the date exactly. But if unless in, unless there's a deadline, a clear deadline, you a time limit you need to work against, and you need to count each day and each of them count. Like again, going back to the example of the the moon is is in one week, the full moon is in one week, then then yeah you come days by days. Uh but uh, but otherwise you, you can you can have some uh artistic uh blur between things. I, I think at least. And you know at the end of the day I mean it would be very pity to play Dragon Prince and refuse your players to be a moon shadow elf. Uh but at the same time, you know, I run Star Wars without Jedi's if you come play Star Wars at my table, I will tell them no Jedi's in Star Wars E6 uh, because I think it's it's sort of defeat the purpose. They, they don't they're not as mysterious. Uh, they could eventually uh, player could become a Jedi in a very very specific set of circumstances. But I really prefer to keep things like uh, Rogue One, for instance. And that doesn't mean you cannot have a monk which who is Jedi-ish, but 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 that, that's it. Uh Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's I mean as a, you had a player that had uh, this uh this this sort of once a month uh ability uh you played it two times <laughs> uh yeah I mean, it's yeah, it's it's to balance and decide. Uh, I don't think it. This specific example is this specific example is is just this character. Uh, you you could have something else if you wanted. Uh, but in terms of the dragon prince, it made a lot of sense to have that because that's something you see happening in the show. It's so I think it needed to be translated to to the thing but none of the pre oh no yes one one only one of the pregens of the the playtest adventure has got uh, that ability uh sneaking six okay we are specialty sword play tracking it's quite straightforward elven butterfly blades yeah she's got those blades which are uh very Special, no SFX yet. Special FX yet unlocked. That means later you could have some development and be able to to do something with plot points. Uh, attributes. What attributes are? I think that it's quite they're quite self-explanatory. But you, of course, when you're writing the sort of book, you want to to specify things. So agility, awareness, influence, intellect, 
spirit and strength. All right. All right. So when we look at Rayla, agility, yeah, definitely. Uh, influence and intellect, yeah, that's not a strong point. But she's got a great awareness, spirit and strength. So yeah, so that's it. In the, she's not terrible, like six in influence and intellect. Uh, and th this is pretty much the standard array, I think, for all the characters. You just swap those. Uh, you're not, you're not, you don't have dump stat, inference and intellect. It's not terrible, but it's still balanced because of the way the system works. No, then we've got the values. Uh, so I guess you could say that the attributes are sort of how you engage with the outside world and the values, it's more uh, what uh, goes on in, in your head and your heart. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> but don't, go ahead, download it. Uh, do you need the link again? It's it's free. Uh, I love it. I, I, I need to, uh, to rewatch this show. Uh, I lost my tracks. Oops. There you go. Really wish I had two screens, but even if I could afford buying a second screen, I don't have the space around me, uh, believe it or not, because I'm in a sort of media center. Uh, devotion, glory, justice, liberty, mastery, truth. Where does right that stands? So our strongest is devotion. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you need to watch the show, but yeah, if I had to pick between the six. Glory 4, yeah, she doesn't care about recognition at all. Uh, and I love the sentence under, if those I care about know me, that's all the legacy I want. That's that spot on the radar. Uh, no, I love the system. I think it's really fitting for the Dragon Prince. Uh, uh, I'd be curious to try to create uh, characters from other shows or other settings. Like you take the Mandalorian and you try to create the, the Star Wars, your typical characters, and uh, you try to, to recreate that with them. Uh, so the game uses something called Cortex Prime, uh, which is not that such a new... On one hand, it's not such a new system. On the other hand, they did a Kickstarter to do a new version of their engine. Which apparently is slightly confusing because uh, the engine itself is not tacked to a game, so it's really a toolbox for you to do stuff with it, which which is a bit off-putting for for some people. I think it would be off-putting for me, but uh, but yeah, this so this game is a version of that. Um, they used to be. Uh, a Smallville game we use Cort uh, the oldest, uh, an older version of uh, Cortex. It was uh, Smallville, the the role playing game. If you like Star uh, Superman and so on, or oh, I, I recommend you should check a Farm to Fable by Michael Ross, uh, who is here in the room, which is a Smallville fan cast, um, which in which I featured several times. We're about to uh, to go for uh, season three. So there you go, Michael. Uh, you've got your uh, you've got your uh, plug. Uh, so yeah, there's a, a Smallville version of uh, Cortex Prime of so Smallville, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, it had the repeat. On one hand, I, I heard people were extremely enthusiastic about it. On the other end, others were really confused by the rules. Okay, so the, the people doing Tales of Gladia are called Fandom Tabletop. Uh, it's Cortex Tabletop Roping Game and Tales of Gladia is coming. The other games are coming. I'd like to check. I want to check. Uh, I don't want to to say the wrong thing, but I think there's another rather exciting game coming with a system from the same family. 
and that was like a somewhat big license what was it mm, I want to find it uh, but it's Dragon Prince. It's Fandom Tabletop. They got a Twitch channel themselves. Should follow them. Ah. Uh, okay, I found their website. Games. find it it might be masters of the universe I, I think it might be masters of the universe i know it's not avatar the last airbender that's mike pie games who, who, who is doing that one it's not cortex prime as far as i know and i would be very surprised if it was uh but um but yeah it might be masters of the universe uh ta -ta -ta -ta. okay back to to this where were we yeah we, we check the values so yeah, I just love how you've got these six points which your player will fill with a, a short sentence and it really fleshes out their character but in a, in a manner which will be brought back again and again. The distinctions, that's where you got your powers. Uh, hey, that's this here uh, next to where I selected. That's Calum. His name is Calum. Like uh, the uh, alias, alias I picked for do my tabletop RPG things, and another character is called Soren, which is the name of my son. So I'm uh, quite happy in Dragon Prince that you have both Kalum and Soren uh, in there. So I hope my son will have uh, assets. An asset is also rated from six to ten, and uh, yeah, so any cool objects you find, you don't need a long list of description. Well, you. Just a little description of what it is, but it's not like many other games where you have a, a set of uh, things, a number of uses, uh, and so on. Uh, let me check what I would like to... Oh, stress. Stress. So, uh, yeah, let's see if I add things right. Uh, you spend plot points to rest, to uh, heal your various stresses. Uh, stress dice are headed to your opposition's pool whenever it might make things harder to you. So they, they works as assets for your foes. So uh, yeah, invoking them uh, is quite a cool feature, but uh, they will be invoked by the game master as well. Uh, types of stress, afraid, angry, anxious, corrupted, exhausted, injured. It's quite self-explanatory. Uh, I'm gonna pass the magic stuff here. Uh, why is it the thing when you can invoke them? Okay, so once they are stepped onto four, they are removed from your character journal. Uh, so they go to six to twelve, not to from four to twelve. Uh, da -da -da -da. What was your idea, King of Demons, for stress? What was it significantly different? Again, I made a parallel between this and uh, somewhat um, mask the new generation. Although you, you don't have the granularity of the the amount of stress, it's just you tick them or not. Okay. Uh, your dice pool, rolling dice, heroic success. If you beat the difficulty by five, it's a win. Effect dice, so that's what I was explaining. So here, it's here, here you're, uh, below here. So yeah, in the, the table there. Uh, so you need to beat a total 
and your minimum effect die, even if you don't have an effect die, it's a four. Uh, here you've got a, a 10, it's 17. Yeah, okay, so in green, it's the effect die they picked. So you see they rolled the best score on the 12 and uh, on the 12 and the 6. So, yeah, I don't know if it, it makes sense to you, to you. So you need to beat a total. For that, you pick two dice, unless uh, you got a special power, like the moon health uh, on a full moon. And once you pick your dice to uh, beat that total, you... Um, <laughs> sorry. You include... You're going to pick an effect die, which is uh, whatever die is left or your highest uh, die, but which you did not use for for your total. Uh, Firefly, a uh, Firefly might be using Cortex Prime also, a version of it. I think Firefly, Smallville, uh, not Buffy, it was Unistem, I think. But yeah, yeah, so Firefly, the, 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 f this is a, a different version. So they developed a, they developed their, their engine which was used for Firefly and made it somewhat cleaner, not cleaner, but with more tools in their toolbox. So you, people can do their own games with them. Uh, and they are doing their, some of games of their own. So Tales of Xadia is a version of Cortex Prime, which is a sequel to Firefly. Uh, but uh, Tales of Xadia is not using everything in it, as far as I understand. Uh, Effect dice in opposition. When rolling dice, the effect die can give you an idea. Oh well, you did in the test. A twelve means the test had mind blowing at come, while a four means it was barely successful. Quite explanatory. I don't know if it results in more stress or less against the, your enemies. Although I suspect that the NPCs don't have stress tracks, which are uh, so, uh, just so granular. Effect dice in automatic outcome. When a test contains a challenge and opposed and you need an effect dice, use the largest die. Okay. Adding extra effect dice. You can spend a plot point to keep an additional effect die. This is most often used to represent doing more than one thing at a time with a single roll. Okay, so it's multiple actions in a way. Hello, probably a satire. Thanks for joining. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much. Many people are there now. Woo! 14! 15! 15! We're only missing 5 people. I'm gonna grab it and... Whoop! If we've got 5 more people, I'm gonna play this very poorly uh, because I, I've been playing it just for a year. Just for a year. Thanks, then, mother. I knew that the ukulele would uh, motivate people. I think, I think I will play. First of all, I will be using. Oops. Hang on. I will be using musician with my phone, so I'm cheating. I'm still learning. I think I will play um, uh, Sloop John B, and maybe some Amelie Poulain uh, for the fans of Amelie. So yeah, we're getting close. I should tweet about that. Thank you so much. It uh, it should be helping for me to get the the affiliate uh, thingy, which it's not entirely clear what it does. You get more emojis and stuff, and people can subscribe. Uh, I don't have huge Twitch ambitions, but I, I like it to set myself little goals like that. Uh, test contests and challenges. Uh, every player. Okay, got a plot point at the beginning. Get bits. Well, what I do with my bits? I I know they are not bitcoins. So, ah, uh, you can start to make money. Well, that's that's where the dough is, right? Okay. Uh, so yeah, you just need to find five people. Sexy emotes. 
thank you so much to everyone who, who joined. Uh, what can I say? Uh, I am Kaloum from the World East podcast. So I produced a, a bunch of different shows which you can find on iTunes and all the podcast platforms. I got a YouTube channel, so please go subscribe. Uh, teaser for ukulele. Mm. Uh, oh yeah, I can try to. I'm trying to to learn. So you got goals. It's a bit like rock band, you know, uh, musician, which is a, a quite a cool app, which exists on desktop, and I tried to use it with uh, OBS, and it just crashed my uh, webcam for some reasons. Uh, but um, no, I'm, I'm all stressed out. Uh, so there's an air. Uh, I don't know what to play now. Uh, can you recognize that? You see, it's I. I didn't lie when I said it would. It would sound poorly. Uh, but it's it's much better once I use musician because then I just do whatever it tells me. Um, completely. Anyway, so that that was your teaser. That's all. But I will play Amelie Pauli. And I will play Snoop John B, which has some double picking, which I, I quite like. So uh, there, there you go. Uh, okay. Uh, test contests and challenges. Okay. Uh, so a conflict. That's a contest. Okay, you against me. Uh, something in between test and content is a challenge this is when the narrator oh no wait when your pc gets into a conflict over something they want this is called a contest which determines if any other character can intervene toward or oppose your character example include fighting a duel with a foe arm wrestling a friend or baking the best pie which is very important in the dragon prince um those uh jelly pies uh, contests are almost always initiated by a player who picks up dice and essentially say, I'm doing this, who's stopping me? Something in between test and contest is a challenge. This is when a narrator describes a situation that might take more than a single test to resolve. Oh yeah, that that seemed quite interesting, but I, I did not quite uh, work out how it was working when I was playing it. Again, go check the, the video from... Did I post the, the video from the gauntlet here? No. Anyway. Uh, yeah, from Frère Jacques, uh, it's good for to go to sleep. Nice uh, recognizing the song. Uh, can I do this before time turns out? How long is this going to be? A player always choose not to respond to a test or a chat. Can I, okay, and find another way forward. Okay, plot points. Okay, special effects and so on. Earning plot points. Itches. The narrator may hand a power point over to you to activate one of your itches. Okay, so it's quite generous. Uh, they can step up a strength. You know, I like it because I'm not. Uh, I got a lot of friends working for Modifuse, and uh, they got the 2D20 system, and they got those momentum tokens, and they, they got an economy of it, and it's a bit too much for me. Uh, I feel that plot points are a bit more light touch. You just give them. You, there's not a total of them in the table, and so on. I don't know. It, it, actually, it might be quite similar. I don't know why momentum uh, turned me off a bit. I don't. Why this gets me excited? So yeah, I should go back to read two D twenty properly. Uh, ta -da -ta -ta. Thank you so much uh, to for your read probably a set here and everyone hanging out. Uh, that's that's so so nice. I, it's already. Record breaking. Oh no, we fell down to nine. I I'm failing to uh to keep people. We were so close, five people away from um uh, playing the ukulele. 
Uh, now we're back at 10. It's it's tough. I think 20 was a good number. You know, it's a good it's a good challenge. It makes things uh, exciting. Oh no, I'm clicking the wrong thing. Uh, okay, let's come back here. Well, keep on trying, then mother. Don't 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 give it uh, just yet. Uh, go tweet and retweet uh, my account. Uh, uh, and if it doesn't happen now, it will happen later. Yeah, of course, if someone says they would play the ukulele, you need to have them play the ukulele. I mean, ukulele was part of the best part of both my experience of Session Zero Con, uh, which was an online convention uh, their mother took part to. I think it was Aki who played the ukulele there. And not only she, she or they played uh, the ukulele at the convention, but I included the performance in my episode dedicated to session zero count, so you can go check it out. Uh, I guess it's only fair that uh, I promote myself shamelessly on my own Twitch channel. It's, it's kind of the reason why I'm doing this, uh, going on Twitch in the first place. Let me fetch the session. Yeah, there you go. And and then mother is in this episode so go check it out uh, to to hear uh what all those lovely people sound like okay back to oops dungeon prince it is so i and uh, so i'm the game master i give a plot point they they rolled uh, a one a hitch and i want to activate it uh, they can step up a stress die on your character Okay, so you roll a 1 while trying to, in the middle of this fight, among your dice, I give you a plot point, and that means your, as you are fighting, your wound is opening further, or you are hit again by your enemy, and so you, you step up your amount of uh, injury in that case, or, or any stress, really. Okay, I dig that. They can create a six temporary asset for one of their NCs involved in the scene. Okay, okay, so, so, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, so, so the, the enemy grabs a new weapon or something like that. Uh, I guess it's it just it's a bit difficult to picture with other situation, or they can step up a die in a challenge pool if there is one. Okay, if you roll multiple itches, the narrator can step up the stress asset or challenge die by one more step for each additional itch you roll, if you, without giving you an additional. Oh wow. Okay, so they could take you down. Um, okay, and it's not, it doesn't have to be accepted by the player. So the, the narrator gives the, the plot point and uh, you go. Uh, no, n no decision on that. Sure, fair enough. If the narrator wants to do different things with each itch you roll, they need to give you a separate plot point. Okay, cool. Otherwise, you only get one plot point, even if they use all the HS to step up one of your stress die. <sighs> well, okay, so again, you can take down someone um, uh, like uh, big time. All right, I should add a counter of followers in uh, in my OBS. I should look up how you do that. Uh, da -da -da -da. But giving in, if you give in during a contest and let your opponent succeed rather than rolling the dice to be dead to tell you earn a plot point. Okay, cool. Uh, that's nice. If you already roll at once in the contest, you don't get a plot point if someone in contest starts the contest and you choose not to oppose it. Okay, so you need the, the contest to be started. Yeah, I I just worked out 
yesterday and today to do it properly or to have the, the chat room uh, above my head. So baby steps. But yeah, now I'm in stream blabs, so uh, it's probably a widget over there, so uh, uh, I should be fine. Oh, you know what? L I'm going to do it now. I'm going to add the Streamlab thingy. Uh, see if I can work it out without the video tutorial. Should be straightforward, right? Uh, widget, chat box, alert box, donation goal, event list, emote wall. Uh, search Streamlabs viewer counter. Your counter. Okay. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's add a viewer counter to all thing. All right. Mm. Oh, where is it? Is it super, super tiny there? Uh, let me make it bigger. Okay. There you go. Uh, can I move it if I want? Right. There you go. All right. Nine. No, come on. There you go. I'm improving. It's, it's like it's not even my final form. Uh, it's full on Dragon Ball Z uh, action here. All right, uh, giving in. So yeah, okay. Uh, some special effects. Those are described in the, the the people's distinctions. Role playing. The narrator is free to end up plot points. Cool. Have some. Love it. Should be limited to one plot point for each such occasion. It's funny because you were saying uh, kings of demons that you would be ending those left and right or something, and I was like, can you actually do that in the rules? I mean. Having fun you're doing it right, as we said, the RPG Academy. But uh, I was like, can you do that? Yeah, you can. You can. Spending plot point activate uh, special effects. Uh, yeah, this, uh, on your character sheet. Uh, create a temporary asset. You can create a temporary asset, a tree branch or a higher ground. Okay, so assets are not necessarily. <laughs> I got the higher ground, Anakin. Uh, you. you, you <laughs> Uh, so yeah, they can be temporary stuff like a slippery floor or something like that. All right, so it's a bit like a fantasy uh, universal role-playing game. Okay, okay, you so, okay, 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 okay. You create something which is there and you interact it with it and it's meaningful. Uh, okay. Include more results. If any role you may spend a plot point to include more results. Okay, so instead of keeping two, you can have three, three, four, four five dice added together. Oh wow. Okay, so with plot points you can really decide. Okay, I'm just succeeding at that thing. I don't care. I just want. I don't want to fail. Um, keep an extra effect die. Our multiple outcomes. Okay, so I want to close the door and uh, lock it or knock the, gu the guard. Share an asset. If you created a temporary asset, you have an asset you own that you'd like to share with other characters. You can spend a plot point to make this asset open, allowing other characters in the scene to use it in their dice. Okay, I like that. Activate opportunities 
when the narrator rolls an opportunity, so that's when a uh, critical fail, which is the same as a player rolling a hitch, uh, you can spend a plot point to activate it if the roll is opening it. So I guess the opportunity will work like the hitches, so the player could yeah could hurt. So that's that's how you could damage uh, non-playing characters. Uh, Okay, you roll your dice to have the difficulty. Yeah, I could have a set difficulty, I guess. Seven. Oh no, we're losing people. Come back. We love you. Eight, nine. It's floating. Uh... I'll come back with some uh, Knight of the Old Republic once I reach a uh, point with discussing that. Okay, so your difficulty is two dice. Uh, it's quite straightforward. Uh, na, 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 na. Here's an example of this. Rayla has been separated from her friends after a battle with the Albarian bandits and hurries to catch up to them. She arrives at a mysterious ravine filled with holding wine winds. Her destination is on the other side, so a player declares that she's going to try to scale the ravine walls to get above the winds. The narrator says this requires a test with a difficulty of 2d8. Rayla players looks at her character journal and assembles her dice pool strength because that's her attribute that covers physical efforts, devotion because she's desperate to reunite with her friends and the ravine is in her way, act first things later because her impulsive nature often helps her avoid hesitation and her Elven butterfly blades, which she is using uh, in their hooks configuration to climb up to help her climb. Well, yeah, that's something which happens all the time in uh, Dragon Prince. Uh, so that's 3d8 plus a d10, a pretty good dice pool. The narrator rolls 2d8, a difficulty 4 and 6 for a total of 10. Rayla players rolls 8, 8, 8, uh, 8, 3d8, 6, 3, 2 on, on the 8, and 6 on the 10. For a total of 12, so uh, two best odds. 16. If she needs it, she picks one of the remaining eight as her side effect. But for this test, the narrator needs is the, tool, the total. Okay. Contest. The struggle. For the contest you are initiating, so you pick up the die. If your position doesn't beat your difficulty, you've won the contest. And yeah, you can choose give in. Uh, you may initiate a contest one. Uh, uh, right as contest. Okay. Uh yeah, so what's going on here? Uh you sure if there is Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So for contact you're the one initiating, so you pick the dice and roll first. I think together two results for a total. If your position is against opposing you yeah. If your opposite side stop you, they assemble the dice pool and try to beat the difficulty you just set. Okay. Yeah, because there was something going on with that, the the struggle which I didn't get when we played it. Uh if your opposition doesn't beat your difficulty, you've won. Okay. If they do beat your difficulty, it goes back over to you. You can choose to give in. You get a plot point. Otherwise your opposition total becomes a new difficulty and you must roll again to try to beat it. Okay, so they beat you, and their roll becomes your own difficulty. Okay. Failing to beat your opposition means your opponent gets to define how they stopped you. Okay. So, and that's a fight, that's a magical contest, that's an argument, they all work the same. Contests go back and forth until one side gives in or fails to beat the difficulty. Yeah, because the difficulty gonna go up and up and up and up and up. So, so you can decide, okay, so, so the difficulty keeps going up and it's kind of a, um, uh, what's the word? Um, yeah, uh, it's got a word like you rise some number, uh, you make bets, uh, and, uh, the, at some point you decide, okay, what are, how likely am I to defeat that or not? Okay, I like that. Uh, yeah, okay. 
Okay, I'd be curious to properly do that in a game because I we didn't. So I think it would take a little while to. So yeah, going back to the Lost Oasis, the adventure. Uh, when we ran it, uh, first of all, I didn't see that picture of the oasis. So I, in my head, I, it was a bit unclear what it was like. Personally, I would take the same story and run it over as a mini campaign. I think it could work uh, without necessarily the leveling up. I don't know if they are in the primer, the, the concept of leveling up. Uh, but you could get assets as gifts and stuff like that. Uh, so you can really get used to the system. And I think after a couple of sessions, things would get really interesting. But the, the concept of the story, uh, for me, I, I loved it. Uh, I think it was really appropriate for the Dragon Prince because it was not about going somewhere and punching someone. Uh, it was pretty much about negotiation, conflicting interests, but at the same time uh, high in colors and, and magical world. But I thought that the the Lost Oasis you I would I would flesh it out a bit. I mean you could improvise most of it with the the framework it gives you and you just use the the pre gen NPCs which are there and maybe you, you can come up with a couple on the fly somewhat easily. Uh, but yeah, I would take, I would, I mean, you, you could, you can run it in three sessions for sure, but I would go six sessions with time jumps and stuff. Uh, the difficulty is how there's a, there's a deadline, there's a, because the, the floating island is going towards a mountain, so you'd have to work out how you manage that. Uh, but yeah, I would take my time uh, with the players more than we, we did uh, in uh, in the session, which you can find uh, on YouTube. Uh, which I'm gonna share again. I don't know if I forgot to to share it. Uh, yeah, let's go back. Okay, uh, hurrying across the rocky cliff, uh, hurrying across the rocky cliff tops to join our friends, Ryla is surprised to see one of the Delbayan bandit, Ulfred, <laughs> from the battle earlier that day. It looks like he was pursuing our friends as well, but took a moment to catch his breath. He was pissing over the cliff. Uh, uh, Ryla's player wants to avoid engaging with his rough character for too long even if she thinks she could easily take him. She decides to sneak along the cliff just out of sight and hope that he doesn't see her. Raylask player declares this and asks the, the narrator if Alfred is going to stop her or in this case notice that somebody is sneaking around. The narrator says, yes, Alfred's is on high alert for anything that is an abandoned, so he's going to contest Rayla's attempt. Okay, so it could have been a simple, you roll two dice of difficulty, it's easy or difficult for Rayla, or you can go into contest. You can decide whether or not you're making it a full scene or not. And what's interesting with the contest, I find with what is described here, is that if it was a fight, if Ryla was fighting Alfred, it would be the same. Mechanically, it would be the same. You don't have a system for the fight like in Dungeons & Dragons. And it's not a criticism of Dungeons & Dragons, I find. My favorite Dungeons & Dragons is 4th edition, and it's all about fight and, uh, and exploring dungeon and uh, keeping tracks of, of all the stuff. So I don't mind that, but I like... What I like here is that the system does what I see a lot of people trying to do with Dungeons & Dragons, succeeding to do with Dungeons & Dragons, but they do it in spite of the system, by setting it aside, which is fair. Uh, again, if you're having fun, you're doing it right, but I think it's a pity a bit. and It means that there's a system which is cumbersome and sort of gatekeepy for a lot of players, you know, getting your head around that. 
So why is it so complicated if you're not using it? I think this one is simpler, but you're gonna use it. So whether you do this contest to avoid Earl Fred, or you're doing this contest just showing up and punching him Fred in the face, it's a contest and it works the same. What's going to be different, it's what you describe and based on those descriptions, which of your attributes, distinctions and assets you are going to use. Uh, so she says, yeah, because Reda initiates the contest, she assembles her dice pool first. She picks Agility 10, since uh, this falls under her ability to move carefully. Truth, because what she is trying to reach her friend, she's hoping to hide the truth of her presence from her friend. Oh, okay, so you can use it the opposite way. Okay, sure. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you can fudge your way, you can argue your way in using whatever. Uh, I don't think it's, it's, it's a problem, uh, as long as you do it in a manner which... Uh, tells the story in a specific way. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very specific... It's a specific game. I'm, I'm not saying it, it's it's the best game uh, that is for everyone in all circumstances and you should use it to run Star Wars, Star Trek, Conan the Barbarian, Dragon Prince, uh, Master of the Universe, Avatar The Last Airbender. Uh, but I, I find it offers a, a rather specific experience which I find uh, appealing uh, and uh, I encourage people to to try uh, because Rayla initiates the contest she assembles her dice pool first. yeah okay so we said that truth uh, moon shadow elf okay she's being discreet it's not the full moon but she's, she's a moon shadow elf and she can use it already so a dice pool is 10 8 8 8 6 Rayla player rolls the dice to set the starting difficulty to Alfred 7 on the 10 yeah okay she okay so 13 with an effect die of eight. The, uh, I look forward to understanding a bit better, maybe a bit more explanation about how the effect die actually works. If it's just an interpretation, or if there are things uh, a bit, uh, a bit, a bit more non strict about that. The narrator looks at Alfred's character journal. He's got awareness eight. Okay, truth six because uh, yeah, okay. And they'll buy and bend it. Eight. It doesn't have any specialities that seem relevant, but the narrator spends one of Alfred's plot points to create a temporary asset. Watchful. Yep. Okay, so it can be a sort of a stance, if you will. I like that. Okay. The narrator rules try to beat the difficulty rate asset. Uh, yeah. Run to taste nine, even if the narrator spent a plot point to keep one of the other dice. The most he could get, it's a 12. He decided not to, and the contest is over. Because Alfred lost the contest, Rayla gets what she wants. So, and again, what I find cool in the way it's resolved, uh, so it's like a fight, but it's not resulting with someone with all their stress filled. Uh, it's not resulting in someone with, with, with a health points, someone killed. Uh, it's resulting into you on the contest and you get what you want. And it could be you restrain that person, could be you escaped or they flee. Uh, it's, it's up to the players and the game master at the beginning of the, who initiates the contest to say what they, they're aiming for. And as long as it makes sense, it's fine. Uh, because Alfred lost the contest, Rayla gets what she wants. She sneaks past and is on her way. She also gets to inflict stress on Alfred with her aid. Okay. So she do she chooses to make it exhausted stress. Alfred's clearly worn out and it's dulling his senses. So does that mean his stress is 8? So actually, you're not taken out of the game when, when your stress bar is full. You're not taken out of the game at all. You, you, what happens to your character is defined by a six, uh, successful contest. But when you, you got your stress bar at 8, it just means that you are really, really burdened uh, by that thing because it's going to add up, it's going to be added 
from the get-go to your opponent's uh, dice pool. I really, really dig this system. I, I find it very, very clean and elegant. I don't know, yeah, I'm curious to see what the... <laughs> Just like it as it is, I'm afraid that they're gonna place test it and make it more complicated. Challenge is overcoming extended obstacles. Mm -hmm. Challenge is at the several rounds. Each one represents okay. Ah, no, that was the thing we the other thing we discussed. The game master explained briefly to us. And the, f the letter is several dice from three to so in a cha in a challenge. Narrator sets out a challenge pool based on how difficult the challenge is and how long it will take to overcome it. The former uses so the former uh, okay. What's the former? In a challenge, you know, the, you know, I don't get that sentence. The former uses the same difficulty rating as a test. The latter is several dice from three to five. Okay. Okay, I think I get it. Okay, he's re they're repeating what's a test and what's. Uh, Okay. Uh, challenges take place over several rounds. Each round represents some passage of time. Could be a few seconds or it could be a minute or hours fighting your way out of a waterlogged tunnel filled with rats. Okay, so it could be a whole section of a dungeon or uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, a riddle of some kind. Uh, the narrator may declare that something happens after a certain number of runes, such as guards arriving, a cave collapsing, or the sun going down over the horizon. So we could do the um, the full moon thing uh, that we were talking about, uh, King of Demons, using uh, this mechanic. I, I am burning here. Uh, Other PC might help you take on the challenge, but everyone must take turns, one turn per player per round. Narrator decides which of you go. So it's yeah, it's a skill challenge like in D and D fourth edition. Finally the narrator gets a turn for the challenge pool just as if it were a character of its own. The narrator chooses a PC to test against. If in the challenge the narrator rolls the challenge pool to see the difficulty. Just like a test. Then you roll your own dice and try to beat the difficulty. If you don't, you fail to progress the challenge. And you take stress equal to the narrator's effect die. Okay. If you beat it, you make progress. And compare your effect die to one of the dice in the challenge pool. If it's bigger, the challenge die is removed from the challenge pool. If it's equal or solid, the challenge die is stepped down by w one step. Okay, so you're going to... Yeah, okay. Okay, so you're gonna drain that thing. Oh. And when you fail, you, f you fail, you, you're stressing yourself out. I'd, yeah, I'd love that p for that waiting, uh, slowing down the nobleman for, wow, I could have used that in, in a folly thing when um, my player was stuck in an inn in the shadow fell the inn of the green lanterns or <laughs> no <laughs> not the inn of the green lanterns of the six lanterns of the five lanterns something like that uh but yeah they were kind of of a, they had a depth they were in kind of a shiro uh, spirit the way situation yeah i i dig this game so much uh, once the challenge pool is reduced to zero dice, the challenge is over and you've won. Okay, so and, and it will speed up as you go. Uh, but at the same time, you've got your stress dice, which are still rolled by the challenge, I imagine. Okay. Uh, all right, it's been two hours since I've been recording. So I think I'm going to have 
dinner uh and i will be back in a little while uh so so yeah uh and hopefully you know it's getting late uh slowly all the people in the us are more likely to join us so maybe maybe we'll manage to beat that current record of 15 viewers and even reach 20 viewers and there might be some ukulele action oh weeping jay joined us thank you so much just checking the counter on twitch twitch itself yeah yeah it's uh the counter seems to be uh working uh yeah so i think that's it for for tonight talking about about tales of of xadia the primer uh just doing that so i can take a, a nice screen grab at some point or i'm gonna do it now uh that was really nice i really really enjoyed uh going through this book uh while talking about it and speaking about my uh what i'm thinking about it uh i think i will do more of that uh i was inspired by uh dread G game master uh and 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 yeah it was it was quite cool so uh let me let me check uh Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you to uh, another another channel. Uh, I'm gonna raid uh, our good friend Michael Ross, and I will be back later. I hope so. Will you? Uh, oop. Wait, it video producer. Where is things? Stream manager. Okay, so. Yeah, thank you so much. Just hang on a couple minutes and uh, and hopefully see you later. Uh, have a, a nice lunch or dinner or breakfast, depending on where you are. And uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube and you, you enjoy it, uh, please let me know. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd be very keen to, to hear about your, your, your own thoughts about Tales of Xadia, uh, the rules primer. Uh, I, I don't know if you share my excitement. Uh, I hope you do, and if you haven't tried it already yet, uh, go check the description uh, of the video. I will make sure to include a direct link to all that free content, uh, which is made available by the the designers of uh, this game, which is um, which I'm very excited about. So, so yeah, thank you, thank you very much, and uh, see you later.